All right, we're coming down to the last two sections of chapter 15, the tail end. And this one is section five, ref cell type and the interior mutability pattern. Interior mutability is a design pattern in Rust that allows you to mutate data even when there are immutable references to that data. Normally, this action is disallowed by the borrowing rules. To mutate data, the pattern uses unsafe code inside a data structure to bend Rust's usual rules that govern mutation and borrowing. We haven't yet covered unsafe code. We will in chapter 19. We can use types that use the interior mutability pattern when we can ensure that the borrowing rules will be followed at runtime, even though the compiler can't guarantee that. The unsafe code involved is then wrapped in a safe API, and our outer type is still immutable. Let's explore this concept by looking at the ref cell type that follows the interior mutability pattern. Hold up, so let's go back to this real quick. Interior mutability is a design pattern that allows you to mutate data even when there are immutable references to that data. That in itself sounds like you can't do this. That breaks the borrowing rules, the ownership things entirely. However, this is allowed if you use unsafe code, which they haven't covered it. They said they'll cover it in chapter 19. Understood. But apparently, you can write unsafe code and wrap it in a safe API. That ensures that the borrowing and ownership rules are done. That ensures that the borrowship and ownership rules are followed at runtime, maybe? Seemingly, we'll see, we'll see. Enforcing borrowing rules at runtime with ref cell. Unlike reference counting type, the ref cell type represents single ownership over the data it holds. So what makes ref cell different from a type like box? Recall the borrowing rules you learned in chapter four. At any given time, you can have either, but not both of, one mutable reference or any number of immutable references. Point two, references must always be valid. With references and box, the borrowing rules invariant are enforced at compile time. With ref cell type, these invariants are enforced at runtime. With references, if you break these rules, you'll get a compile error. With ref cell, if you break these rules, your program will panic and exit. I see, I see, I see. So the difference between rough cell and box seemingly is just when these rules are enforced. They both follow the borrowing rules. However, one is enforced at compile time, which then the, the program won't compile, just tell error and tell you what the error is. And the other one's enforced at runtime, which means your program will compile, but if you do anything shady, it's gonna panic. The advantages of checking the borrowing rules at compile time are that errors will be caught sooner in the development process, and there is no impact on runtime performance because all of the analysis is completed beforehand. For those reasons, checking the borrowing rules at compile time is the best choice in the majority of cases, which is why this is Rust's default. Yeah, they're explaining how checking at compile time, find the error early, fix it, early in the development process, waste very little time in terms of developers because they already know it's there, get it done early. Understood, yes, benefits. The advantage of checking the borrowing rules at runtime instead is that certain memory safe scenarios are then allowed, whereas they are disallowed by the compile time checks. Static analysis like the Rust compiler is inherently conservative. Some properties of code are impossible to detect by analyzing the code. The most famous example is the halting problem, which is beyond the scope of this book, but is an interesting topic to research. So here they stated some of the advantages of checking the bar rules at runtime, which mainly, at least in my interpretation of this, is there are some cases that are safe that the compiler will say are not safe just because the compiler errs on the side of caution and is conservative. And there is a famous problem that exemplifies this. I have no idea what the halting problem is, so let's let's look that up real quick.
halting problem. In computability theory, the halting problem is the problem of determining from a description of an arbitrary computer program and an input whether the problem will finish running or continue to run forever. Okay. 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 Um, so speculating on what I read here and some of this. It seems as though this is a theoretical problem, as in, theoretically, it is impossible to prove that for every type of arbitrary program, given that there's an input, you can, using just those two pieces of information, decide or figure out whether or not the program's going to finish running or continue running forever. However, it could be possible that given that you can do these checks during or while the program is running, you'll have more information and thus be able to figure out that answer. Hmm. Okay. Going back. Because some analysis is impossible, if the Rust compiler can't be sure the code compiles with the ownership rules, it might reject a correct program. In this way, it's conservative. If Rust accepted an incorrect program, users wouldn't be able to trust in the guarantees Rust makes. However, if Rust rejects a correct program, the programmer will be inconvinced, but nothing catastrophic can occur. The rough cell type is useful when you're sure your code follows the borrowing rules, but the compiler is unable to understand and guarantee that. Okay, so just like the halting problem states, similarly, the Rust problem or the compiler issue that they're talking about here is that there are cases where Rust will reject a correct program because it, at compile time, it cannot tell if the code you wrote, the code that it's looking at, follows the borrowing rules and principles. In those scenarios, you can use rough cell to do what you want to do. And that's probably when you should be using this. Outside of that, don't touch this, please. Similar to reference counting type, rough cell type is only for use in single threaded scenarios and will give you a compile time error if you try using it in a multi-threaded context. We'll talk about how to get the functionality of rough cell in a multi-threaded program in chapter 16. Which is the next chapter, so it's not that far away. Just note that reference counting and ref cell types, single threaded applications only. Don't try to use them in multi-threaded context. Here's a recap of the reason to choose box, reference counting, or reference cell types. Point one, reference counting enables multiple owners of the same data. Box and ref cell have single owners. Box allows immutable or mutable borrows checked at compile time. Reference counting allows only immutable borrows checked at compile time. Ref cell allows immutable or mutable borrows checked at compile time. Because rough cell type allows mutable borrow checked at runtime, you can mutate the value inside the rough cell even when the rough cell is immutable. Okay, so that was a nice little chart. Mutating the value inside an immutable value is the interior mutability pattern. Let's look at a situation in which interior mutability is useful and examine how it's possible, which is why we're here. We want to see how this pattern is done. Scroll down. Let me just move that to the side, open my editor. Interior mutability, a mutable borrow to an immutable value. A consequence of the borrowing rules is that when you have an immutable value, you can't borrow it mutably. For example, this code won't compile. And they have let x equal 5, let y equals mutable value of x, or mutable reference to x, which, no. If you try to compile this code, you get the following error. x is immutable. Yeah, that makes sense. However, there are situations in which it will be useful for a value to mutate itself in its methods, but appear immutable to other code. 
code outside the values method would not be able to mutate the value. Using ref cell is the one way to get the ability to have interior mutability. But ref cell doesn't get around the borrowing rules completely. The borrow checker in the compiler allows this interior mutability and the borrowing rules are checked at runtime instead. If you violate the rules, you'll get a panic instead of a compile error. Um, so here they sort of painted the picture of when and how you would go about using this. So the situations are, well, it's really just one situation that they painted. You have a variable here, and you want this variable to seem immutable to the outside world. However, on the inside, you want to be able to mutate it. Let's say, like, I don't know, some of the methods on it can change the state within it, but other people outside can't actively do anything. Let's walk through a practical example where we can use ref cell type to mutate an immutable value and see why that is useful. Let's do it. Mocking objects. We're going to go over mocking? Oh, I was hoping. Oh, this is nice. This is nice. I, I, that's one of the questions I've had ever since I started learning Rust is in terms of testing, how do you go about mocking objects? Because I do it all the time in Python. All the time. Something I can't live without in Python. Using a use case for interior mutability, mock objects. A test double is the general program concept for a type used in place of another type during testing. Mock objects are specific types of test doubles that record what happens during a test so you can assert that the correct actions took place. Very true. Yes. Rust doesn't have objects in the same sense as other languages have objects. And Rust doesn't have mock object functionality built into the standard library as some other languages do. However, you can definitely create a struct that will serve the same purpose as a mock object. I'm excited. Let's do this. Here's the scenario we'll test. We'll create a library that tracks a value against a maximum value and sends messages based on how close to the maximum value the current value is. This library could be used to keep track of a user's quota for the number of API calls they're allowed to take. For example, our library will only provide the functionality of tracking how close to the maximum value is and what the messages should be at what times. Applications that use our library will be expected to provide the mechanism for sending the messages. The application could put a message in an application, send an email, send a text, or something else. The library does not need to know that detail. All it needs is something that implements a trait we'll provide called Messenger. Listing 15-20 shows the library code. Um, yeah, let's write this out, definitely. This is source that lives that RS. New Rust file lives that RS. Public trait messenger. Function has a send function, takes a pointer to self, has a message that is a pointer to a string. Just okay. That's pretty simple. Pub struct limit tracker. It takes a lifetime. Hmm, haven't seen these in a while. T is the trait that it that T is going to be associated to the trait, which is ah takes a lifetime and it has T, which is going to be the arbitrary value that's passed in that has to implement the messenger trait.
So we have messenger, which is a pointer, has a lifetime of A, so just make sure that T lasts as long as A does. You have value, U size, and we have the max, which is also a U size. Implement for our lifetime back again. A for a type T limit tracker. A type T. Does it indent for me? It does not. Tab where T implements the messenger trait. So here's where we put the functions. We have a public function new messenger takes a reference to t and max u size and returns a limit tracker t. Then we just have limit tracker and we use the shorthand. So messenger value wasn't defined and it wasn't a variable that was passed in, so we can't use the shorthand for that. I have to explicitly set it. And then max. Okay, so so far that makes sense. And then we have this stuff, which is also a function. So that's the u, u, and used to be here. Public function set value. Ah, this is the mutable part. Takes a mutable reference to self as a value u size. Self that value equal to value. Let percentage get this out of the way. Percentage of max equal self that value as sixty four. So we're casting it to a float. 64 bit, and you should probably do the same thing self that max because they have to be the same type of 64. If the percentage of max is greater or equal to 1.0, self that messenger dot send and then we pass in the message here they have show copy error you're over your quota that's that's good to know else if percentage Is greater or equal to zero point nine self that message that send and here they have urgent warning you've used up over ninety percent of your quota copy paste. And I believe this is also an else if. Else if percentage greater than or equal to 0 0.75. So 
tell the messenger that send warning if you stop 75 if you used up over 75 percent of your quota and that is the library we can well just see if it compiles cargo run hello world yeah it compiled One part of this code is that the messenger trait has one method called send that takes an immutable reference to self and the text of the message. This is the interface our mock object needs to have. The other important part is that we want to test the behavior of the set value method on the limit tracker. We can change what we pass in for the value parameter, but set value doesn't return anything for us to make assertions on. We want to be able to say that if we create a limit tracker with something that implements the messenger trait and a particular value for max, when we pass different numbers for value, the messenger is told to send the appropriate messages. Um, yeah, right here they're just stating we want to be able to test this. In order to test this, we need to have something that implements messenger, well, implements the send method because we want to be able to test the send but we also want to be able to test the internal value that is set um, during the set value, which is we want to be able to test this thing. And we want to make sure it sends out the appropriate messages. We need a mock object that instead of sending an email or a text message when we call send, will only keep track of the messages it's told to send. We can create a new instance of the mock object, create a limit tracker that uses the mock object, call the set value method on limit tracker and then check the and then check that the mock object has the messages we expect listing 15-21 shows an attempt to implement a mock object to do just that listing 15-21 shows an attempt to implement a mock object to do just that but the borrow checker won't allow it so here they're just describing how to use mock objects um, typically I, I, typ I write python for a living so in Python, I'll create a mock object and um, they have, it's in the standard library. It's one of those languages that has it implemented in the standard library. So all you have to do is have a path to the object. Then you have this thing. And then whenever you want to call, let's say in this case, it's send, right? Well, uh, limit tracker set value. Anytime set value would be called, um, then for my mock object, I can look at send and see what it was called with. That's what we want to recreate here. And I should be able to write this here, actually. This is not limited to a file, and it is here, lib.rs. Cool. Let's move this over, get rid of that, make that a little bit bigger. Give me some space. All right. So we have the configuration tag. Configuration, I'm gonna make a test, because we're writing tests, and there's gonna be a test block mod test use super star because we want to import everything above it that's in this file into this section or into this mod we're going to create our struct mock messenger sent messages vector of strings and they're going to be own strings too which is sort of weird given that the messages that we send are pointers right uh, yeah okay and now we need to implement the the messenger trait no wait no, we don't do that yet. First, we implement new creation of it. Mock messenger. We need to be able to create our mock function new 
doesn't need anything in it returns my messenger my messenger sent messages back this empty and that's going to be returned so that's all we need there next we're going to implement the messenger trait for our mock messenger okay messenger for and we move this up a little bit function send takes a mutable reference to nope takes a reference to self not mutable has message which is a point of the string self that sent messages that push because we want to push all of the messages that this thing wants to send to this list this vector and then we can just check that vector later on in, when we were verifying and making our asserts. String from message. So yeah, we're using a method on from the string to create the capital S strings from these messages. Makes sense. And then we're going to write our first test. Function, it sends an over 75% warning message. That mock messenger equal mock messenger new which we created just now let mutable limit tracker equal limit tracker new a reference to the mock messenger which implements the messenger trait and 100. But so let me go back to that function so I can see what it does. It takes the max, so the max is going to be 100. Got it. Limit tracker dot set value 80. And now we want to assert that one message is sent. Assert equal mock messenger dot sent messages dot length equals one. And the reason why we should only have one message sent is because we only called this once. If we called it multiple times, it should be multiple messages sent. However, as we know when we were writing this, this is pink, this should not compile. So let's just confirm that. Ooh, uh, cargo test, right? That's interesting. Cargo test results, zero pass, zero failed. It didn't run any of the tests. This means I also didn't see anything fail. So I figured out what the issue was. The issue was I named the file incorrectly. I named mine libs.rs instead of lib.rs. And as such, it didn't find the file. It didn't run it the way it was supposed to. Anyway, 
let's come back to this error. Let's see, make that big. Cannot borrow self that sent messages as mutable as it is behind a reference. I see. This statement right here is exactly what the ref cell type does. Behind a reference, you can borrow things that are mutable or do things, change things. Help, consider changing this to a mutable reference. Okay. Let's see what they say here. This test code defines a mock messenger struct that has a sent messages field with a vec of string values to keep track of the messages it's told to send. We also define an associated function new to make it convenient to create new mock messenger values that start with an empty list of messages. We then implement the messenger trait for mock messenger so we can give a mock messenger to a limit tracker. In the definition of the send method, we take the message passed in as a parameter and store it in the mock messenger list of sent messages. So here they're just going over everything we just wrote. Yes, we did this. Yes, it makes sense. That is the intent. In the test, we're testing what happens when the limit tracker is told to set value to something that has more than 75% of the max value. First, we create a new mock messenger which will start with an empty list of messages. Then we create a new limit tracker and give it a reference to the new mock messenger and a max value of 100. We call the set value method on the limit tracker with a value of 80, which is more than 75% of 100. Then we assert that the list of messages that the mock messenger is keeping track of should now have one message in it. That is what we want to do. That is, in essence, what the test is doing. So go to the test real quick. Create a new messenger, a mock messenger. Create a new limit tracker. Set the max is 100. Set the value to 80, which is greater than 75, which means that we should get the, the third point in the if-else statement. And then we wanted to assert that in sent messages list, there's at least one item in it. However, there's one problem with this test as shown here, and we already looked at the error, but let's see what they have here just to make sure it's the same. Cannot borrow immutable field, self that messages as mutable. So the wording is slightly different, but it is the same error. Yeah, the wording is slightly different. I think we have more words here than they do. Okay. We can't modify the mock messenger to keep track of the messages because the send method takes an immutable reference to self. We also can't take the suggestion from the error text to use mutable self instead because then the signature of send wouldn't match the signature in the messenger trait definition. Feel free to try and see what error message you get. I'm not gonna do that because I don't think it makes sense but I understand why they stated it. The whole try to change that to mutable and see what errors you get. Nah. This is a situation in which interior mutability can help. We'll store the sent messages within a rough cell type, and then the send message will be able to modify sent messages to store the messages we've seen. Listing 15-22 shows what that looks like. All right, it doesn't even look like much has changed, huh? So we're coming back to the top where we have super. And then we're also going to import rough cell. So we'll use standard library cell ref. Oh, it's not going to auto compose. Oh, not going to auto compose because I don't have the full word. Ref cell. And then messages, this type is going to change. It is now going to be a rough cell. And the type within it is going to be vector of strings. And in the new 
function where we create our mock messenger, this has to be changed. So this vector is now a rough cell new. Let me pass the vector inside of it. Anything else change? Bar mutable. This call. Okay. So in our implementation of send for the messenger trait, we don't push directly. Instead, we borrow mutable, which seemingly is a method on the ref cell type. And then after that, once we have a mutable reference to the vector, we can push to it. And then we do something similar down here. We want to check the messages. We have to borrow it. And this time we don't have to borrow a mutable reference because we're just looking at something. We're not, we're not changing the, the vector. Borrow. And that should work. Let's test it out. I make you, oh. There we go. Cargo test. One test passed. Wow, so this is how I should go about doing it. This is how I should go about mocking my, my, my test objects. Or mocking my objects so that I can test them. That is good to know. Okay. The send message field is now the type ref cell vector string instead of vector string. In the new function, we created a new ref cell vector string instance around the empty vector. For the implementation of the send method, the first parameter is still an immutable borrow of self, which matches the trait definition, which we have right here, immutable borrow of self. We call borrow mutable on the ref cell vector string in self that sent messages to get a mutable reference to the value inside the ref cell vector string, which is the vector. Then we can call push on the mutable reference to the vector to keep track of the messages sent during the test. Yes. The last change we have to make is in the assertion. To see how many items are in the inner vector, we call borrow on the ref cell vec string to get the to get an immutable reference to the vector. Now that you've seen how to use ref cell, let's dig into how it works.